Welcome to lecture 14. One of the great achievements of quantum mechanics is its ability to describe the chemical bond. In this preparation lecture, we will examine how solutions to the Schrodinger equation can describe chemical bonding in a qualitative way. This lecture will be delivered in two parts. The first part will focus on molecular orbitals and how we can use them to predict the strength of bonds between atoms. The second part will look at hybridized orbitals. Hybridized orbitals help determine the geometry the molecules take and are predicted by solutions to the Schrodinger equation. Molecular orbital theory is one dominant theory used to describe covalent bonds. They are constructed as linear combinations of atomic orbitals. This means that we can simply take the wave function solutions to the Schrodinger equation for atomic orbitals and add and subtract them to make molecular orbitals. These molecular orbitals are populated with electrons using the Pauli exclusion principle and Hund's rules. Let's begin our discussion of molecular orbitals by looking at hydrogen. In the ground state, hydrogen will have two molecular orbitals, and this is denoted as psi plus minus is equal to the 1s orbital from one of the hydrogen atoms plus or minus the 1s orbital from the second hydrogen atom. See how the two orbitals are simply taking the 1s orbital from each hydrogen and adding and subtracting them. The two orbitals are denoted as psi plus and psi minus, where psi plus concentrates the electron density between the two protons. This is due to constructive interference of the two waves that represent the electrons in the 1s orbitals. Because the electron density is concentrated between the protons, it is referred to as a bonding orbital. Psi minus excludes electron density between the two protons. This is due to destructive interference of the two waves that represent the electrons in the 1s orbital. Because the electron density is excluded between the two protons, it is referred to as an antibonding orbital. Here are two illustrations that demonstrate the concentration of electron density between and away from the center of the two nuclei, depending on if the orbital is bonding or antibonding due to constructive or destructive interference. Since the electron density is symmetric about the internuclear axis, meaning along the axis that goes through the two nuclei, both are called sigma orbitals. Prior to examining the p-based molecular orbitals, let's briefly return to the shape of the p-orbital. When sketching the shape, we can plot a cosine theta term on polar paper to get the familiar dumbbell shape. The cosine of angles between 0 and 90 degrees will result in a positive number, hence that region is denoted with a plus sign. The cosine of angles between 90 and 180 degrees are negative, so that region is denoted with a negative sign. We can think of this plus and minus signs as the wave that represents this orbital being in opposite phases, or that if the wave is up on the right-hand side, then it's down on the left-hand side. This has ramifications when 2p orbitals overlap from different atoms, as it determines if they constructively or destructively interfere. In general, p orbitals will have a higher energy than s orbitals. Given the orientation of p orbitals, two types of molecular orbitals formed from p orbitals exist. Let's assume that the z-axis is the internuclear axis, meaning that it goes through both nuclei. Then the pz orbital forms a sigma bond since the wave function solutions directly overlap. If the up part of both p orbitals overlap, they constructively interfere and a bonding orbital results. If the up part overlaps with a down part, then the wave function destructively interferes and an antibonding orbital occurs. Since we said that the z-axis is the internuclear one, then the px and py orbitals are perpendicular to this axis. They can form the other type of molecular orbital, pi orbitals. When these orbitals overlap constructively, a bonding orbital is formed, and if they overlap destructively, an antibonding orbital occurs. Let's now look at the relative energies of bonding and antibonding orbitals. A simple example is bonding in H2. Here we have the two 1s orbitals on their own with an electron each. In the center is the bonding and antibonding orbital. Let's qualitatively describe the energy of the bonding and antibonding orbitals. As we saw in the hydrogen atom lecture, the energy of a 1s state is a negative number. For the bonding orbital, a negative number plus a negative number gives an even more negative number. So, Bonding orbitals stabilize molecules, which is the expected result. For the antibonding orbital, a negative number minus a negative number gives a less negative number, or even a positive one. 
these orbitals destabilize molecules. Therefore, the energy of bonding orbitals would be lower than that of antibonding orbitals. We can build up similar molecular orbital diagrams for other diatomic molecules. The electrons populate these molecular orbitals using Hund's rules and the Pauli exclusion principle. Following these rules, we can accurately predict the paramagnetic tendencies in diboron and oxygen molecules given their unpaired electrons. Also, notice that as the atomic number gets bigger, that the energies of these molecular orbitals tend to decrease. Most striking is that the energy of the sigma 2pz orbital drops below the bonding 2px and 2py pi orbitals at oxygen. So, as we have seen, bonding orbitals tend to draw nuclei together and antibonding orbitals tend to push nuclei apart. We can set up a simple relationship where if we assume that the effects of bonding orbitals are cancelled out by antibonding orbitals, we can predict the strength of a bond by looking at the net number of electrons in bonding orbitals. This is formalized as the number of electrons in bonding orbitals minus the number of electrons in antibonding orbitals divided by 2 is equal to something called the bond order. Bond orders can be directly related to what type of bond is in between the atoms. So for instance, a bond order of 1 means that there is a single bond between the pair of atoms. A bond order of 2 means there is a double bond, and a bond order of 3 means there is a triple bond. Let's look at a few examples now about calculating bond orders. In this first example, we're going to look at calculating the bond order of H2+. And so in this case, we have the 1s orbital on one of our hydrogen atoms, we have the molecular, or sorry, the atomic orbital, the 1s from the other hydrogen atom, and as we saw, these form two molecular orbitals. One is a bonding orbital, and the other one is an antibonding orbital. Now since this is H2+, we actually only have one electron, and so that one electron then populates inside the 1s molecular orbital or in this case, sorry, we'll just call it a sigma orbital, or the antibonding orbital we'll call sigma star. And so then if we follow the bond order, or how we calculate bond orders, is that we would say number of electrons in um, bonding orbitals minus the number of electrons in antibonding orbitals divided by 2. Well, in this case, since we have one electron in a bonding order orbital, then I'm going to write 1 minus... I have no electrons in the antibonding orbital, so I'll write a zero there. I'll divide that by two. And so the bonding, or the, the bond order in this case is equal to one half. Let's now look at the bond order of molecular hydrogen. And so in this case, we can draw the exact same diagram where I have my 1s orbital on my one, my 1s orbital on my other hydrogen atom that I'm bringing together. This again forms two molecular orbitals, where one is the bonding and the other one's the antibonding. And in this case, each hydrogen has one electron. And so that means then that we populate both of them inside the bonding orbital. And so when I calculate the bond order, then what I would say is number of electrons in bonding orbitals minus the number of electrons in antibonding orbitals divided by two. In this case, now I have two electrons in bonding orbitals. I still have zero in antibonding orbitals. And so that means I have a bond order of one. And so what this tells us is that when I ionize H2 into H2+, I actually weaken the bond between the two hydrogen atoms. That's what these bond orders are telling us, given that the bond order of H2 is a larger number than the bond order of H2+. Finally, let's look at H2-. So I've now added a third electron to the system. So again, I draw my molecular orbital diagram. There's my one hydrogen atom. Here's my other hydrogen atom. I again draw my antibonding orbital, my bonding orbital. In this case, I now have three electrons in total, where now I still populate two into the bonding orbital, but now I actually put one in the antibonding orbital. And so now I calculate the bond order, number of electrons in bonding orbitals minus the number of electrons in antibonding orbitals divided by 2. And so in this case, again, I can write 2, but now I subtract 1 and divide by 2, and I get 1 half again. 
So what this ends up telling us is that molecular hydrogen, the H2, ends up having the strongest bond out of these three cases, where if I add an extra electron, I weaken the bond, and if I take away an electron, I also weaken the bond. And so this is part of the predictive power of how bond orders can tell us how strong the bonds are between atoms. Based on the molecular orbital diagram presented earlier, we can create a table which includes the ground state electronic configuration and the bond order of each diatomic molecule. We can also include measured values for the bond length and the bond energy. If we plot the bond order, the bond energy, and the bond length, we can see the intuitive relationships that we would expect. As the bond order increases, the bond energy also increases, and the bond length decreases. Conversely, as the bond order decreases, so does the bond energy. This correlates to an increase in bond length. This demonstrates the qualitative predictive power of bond order to determine the strength of bonds, which is based on the quantum mechanical treatment of molecules.